Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lynn Lopo. I'm the director of the Center for Policy Research. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the 28th Herbert Lorry Memorial Lecture on Health Policy. As many of you know, the Lorry Lecture is held in honor of Dr. Herbert Lorry, who was a distinguished physician and member of the national and international medical communities in the field of neurosurgery. I would like to particularly welcome several of Dr. Lurie's family members who are here with us today. His daughters, Karen Blanchard and Suzanne Lurie, as well as Suzanne's husband, Stephen Wisbaum. Thank you for being here. <laughs> this lecture series is a wonderful opportunity to bring our community together with a distinguished and thoughtful individual who was involved in the issues that animated Dr. Lurie's life. Today's topic is particularly relevant. The Lurie family was a victim of gun violence. Dr. Lurie and his wife, Betty, were both wounded Dr. Lurie fatally. Betty survived and was, until she passed away two years ago, a longtime supporter of many educational, social, and cultural initiatives in our community, including Syracuse University. I would now like to introduce you to the Dean of the Maxwell School and the Lewis A. Bantle Chair in Business Government Policy, David Van Slyke. David is, yeah, sure. <laughs> David is a close friend and has an exciting vision for the school and I think we're all very excited to be a part of that. Prior to becoming Dean of the Maxwell School, David was Associate Dean and Chair of the Maxwell uh, the Maxwell's Department of Public Administration and International Affairs. He is a tenured professor in the Maxwell School in the College of Arts and Sciences and a leading international expert on public-private partnerships, public sector contracting and contract management, and policy implementation. Welcome, David. I'm delighted to be here today for the 28th annual Herbert Lorry Memorial Lecture on Health Policy. Like Len, I too would like to thank the Lorry family for their generous support that has made this lecture possible. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for this important talk. It's great to see so many leaders from the public and private sectors, leaders from business, from healthcare, and from the nonprofit community. And it's gratifying to see so many alumni here today who serve our community in so many important leadership roles. One that I might mention specifically is our Assemblyman, Bill Magnarelli. He's in the back of the audience, Maxwell graduate in history, as well as a graduate of the Syracuse University College of Law. And I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the indigenous people upon whose ancestral lands we now gather. I thank the Center for Policy Research for hosting the annual Lorry Lecture. CPR is home to nationally and internationally recognized scholars who conduct a broad range of interdisciplinary research and other activities related to public policy. It houses both the Education Finance and Accountability Program and the Learner Center for Public Health Promotion, which Professor Tom Dennison directs. The center and its outstanding leadership team is directed by Len Lopo, who you just heard from. Len is a professor of public administration and international affairs as well as co-editor of the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. Len's research interest primarily involves the family, issues of fertility, marriage, maternal employment, and public policies de designed to assist the low-income population. Len's the recipient of numerous awards for his research and teaching, including the Burkhead Burkhead Teaching Excellence Award, a Meredith Professor Recognition Award, and the Daniel Daniel Patrick Moynihan Award. The Lorry Lecture is an endowed public address delivered annually by leading figures in the area of healthcare administration and policy. It's jointly sponsored by the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and the Center for Policy Research, the Central New York Community Foundation, and others. The lecture series has a long history here at the Maxwell School. The inaugural lecture was held in 1989. And as you can see on the back of your program, we've had the pleasure of welcoming many distinguished researchers in the field of healthcare policy and management. This year's speaker, Dr. Daniel Webster, 
is one of the nation's leading experts on a topic that is very important within our own Syracuse community, throughout the nation, and internationally, firearm policy and the prevention of gun violence. Dr. Webster is a professor of health policy and management at the John Hopkins School of Public Health, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research, and the deputy director for research for the Johns Hopkins Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. He's also a core faculty of the Johns Hopkins Center for Injury Research and Policy. Dr. Webster, along with the team from Johns Hopkins, recently worked with the Baltimore Police Department in a joint effort to reduce violent crime by promoting, developing, and evaluating interventions aimed at curbing violence. He has published numerous articles on firearm policy, youth gun acquisition and carrying, the prevention of gun violence, intimate partner violence, and adolescent violence protection, prevention. He has also studied the effects of a variety of violence prevention interventions, including state firearm and alcohol policies, policing strategies, street outreach and conflict mediation, public education campaigns, and school-based curricula. Please welcome our Lori lecturer, Dr. Daniel Webster. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the Laurie family for having this. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here, and, and I've just enjoyed my, my day here so far with uh, so many nice people. Um, got a lot to cover and not a lot of time. How do you reduce gun violence in America? It seems rather daunting. Um, I'm going to take you through what I think are some of the key, uh, key things we uh, can do to have far less gun violence in America. I'm going to leave some things out because, again, you know, we, we could spend a few of these in a row uh, and not cover everything. But we will have some time at the end for questions, um, answers, and, and comments that you might have um, about something I talked about or, or something that I, I missed. Um, when we think about our country and, and violence, uh, it's easy for us to just conclude that uh, we are a terribly violent nation. Uh, we see violence on a daily basis when we open our newspapers, turn on our, our computers, listen to the radio or TV. Um, but I, I want to um, impress upon you my own, what, what I think the data tells us about the United States and, uh, and violence. If you compare the United States with other high-income Western democracies, what you'll find is we're average on a broad range of indicators of aggression, violence, and risk factors for violence. And these are depicted here. Uh, we don't use violent media any more than these other countries. Um, we don't have more bullying or adolescent fighting. Our rates of mental illness are comparable. Actually, on substance abuse, we're on the low end of the spectrum. Um, but what sets us apart is our homicide rates. Our homicide rates are about seven times higher than the average of these other high-income countries. And that's because our gun homicide rate is about 25 times higher. Um, this is a trend for our uh, homicide rates nationally from 1990 through 2014. These data come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention based upon death certificate data. They do not include 2015 and the FBI, which is a different uh, government agency collecting information on similar outcomes have shown that we have experienced a noteworthy increase in 2015 and in some cities are seeing increases in 2016 as well. But the important thing I want to impress upon you is, is how far we have come. Um, 
I started my career, uh, I uh, came to Johns Hopkins on the faculty in 1992. And, oops, what did I just do? And you'll see what progress that I contributed to. No, I didn't do that. Um, no, the, the point is our, our, our gun homicide rates are about half what they used to be or, or, or even less. Uh, so when I first entered this field, th there was a feeling that, oh my God, how are we ever going to tackle this problem? How are we ever going to create great, greater safety and less gun violence? And we did. Um, what is so noticeable, however, is the mass shootings, these shootings that occur uh, in public places with a lot of victims that make us all feel incredibly vulnerable. Uh, this uh, simple graph just shows you some different era, era excuse me, uh, before, during, and after we had a federal assault weapons ban that also uh, banned large capacity magazines. Uh, um, and what we've seen here is a threefold increase in recent years in both the number of people killed and um, non fatally wounded in public mass shooting events. What we don't see is actually the most common form of death by gun in the United States, and that is suicide by guns. Suicides by guns outnumber homicide by guns almost two to one. Okay? So this is an enormous part of our problem. However, in this talk, I'm only going to briefly talk about that. Uh, but again, we could have a whole separate conversation. But I think there's a lot that we can and should do on that front. What's behind this recent trend is principally driven uh, by uh, white middle age um, and older men. So here are the points I'm just going to touch in our conversation today that, that, that I think are important pathways to having much uh, lower rates of gun violence in America. I'll talk to you about our current, uh, pr what, you know, a technical term, prohibiting conditions. How do we screen people out of someone who can legally have a gun or not? And I'm, I'll talk about how I think we can do that in a far more rational way that screens out more people prone to violence than our current policies. If those are going to be effective, however, you need basic measures of accountability built in your firearm policy that prevents those who are prohibited from obtaining guns. So these are what I broadly call accountability measures. Background checks are, are a key component, but they're not the only thing for accountability to prevent uh, transfer of guns to prohibited people. It's also, in my opinion, going to be important, uh, particularly as it relates to curbing urban uh, gun violence, to refocus our, our, our resources and our approaches with less emphasis on drugs and more, interested, more emphasis excuse me, on guns and violence. There's a strategy that I'll talk to you about, about focused deterrence, a very prevention-oriented way to use law enforcement resources in combination with uh, services and other more prevention-oriented <coughs> strategies. Um, we also need to sort of um, make inv the investigation of gun crimes far more scientific than it is today. You, you can watch TV shows and get the feeling that, oh, we've got an enormous amount of science that, that we're using. I wish it was as easy as those programs show, but I do think we can make advancements, not only on the physical evidence, the physical science of it, but also on the social science. How do you elicit information from witnesses? How do you make them comfortable to come forward to help you solve crimes to get people off the street who are shooting people and to change a current dynamic where it's largely street justice. 
They do not rely on the police to hold some account, someone accountable. They hold them accountable through more gun violence. So if we can do a better job on that front, while it's principally thought of as a law enforcement strategy, in my opinion, it is also a prevention strategy that we can do much better on than we currently do. I'll talk to you about a public health strategy that uses credible messengers to try to change social norms and mediate some of these uh, conflicts among the highest risk individuals. Um, and then I'll talk about some uh, cost-effective neighborhoods improvements. So this is sort of encompasses how someone like myself in public health thinks about this is a broad problem and it has many dimensions. Um, and while it could sound sort of daunting, like, oh, we have to cover all of these bases? No, we don't have to cover all of these bases. But we're going to have uh, a much bigger impact if we can cover as, as many of these as possible. All right, I'm going the wrong direction. I know what happened. All right. This is a quick snapshot of what gun policy looks like as it relates to the regulation of firearm sales in the United States. This is somewhat complicated. Uh, the second column is federal uh, policy. And in the last column is the number of states, including the District of Columbia, I just granted it statehood, um, that, that have uh, these measures in place. The first has to do what I was talking about before, about how do we determine uh, prohibiting conditions. Uh, so generally, at the federal level and in most states, if you've been convicted of a felony, um, you, you will not be able to get a gun if you are under the age of 18, you also can't get a gun. Certain prohibitors, if you're dangerously mental, mentally ill. Um, but when you look at violent crimes that are not felonies, which are highly, highly re related to serious violence, many, many of those misdemeanors were originally charged as felonies and then pled down to misdemeanors. Um, the federal law only prohibits someone if that violent misdemeanor was a domestic battery charge. 13 additional states extend this beyond just domestic violence to cover other violent misdemeanors. It may come as a surprise to some of you that um, in most states, you, uh, if you are between the ages of 18 and 20, you may not legally purchase or consume an alcoholic beverage, but you can purchase and acquire a handgun legally. Um, so that's an that's, uh, aspect of our, of our laws that could be um, addressed. Um, there are also um, 20, uh, 27 states that have prohibitions that are temporary in nature if someone's committed a very serious crime, but it's adjudicated in, in um, juvenile courts. The background check records is something we hear a lot about. 18 states plus the District of Columbia have some form of extending background checks to private sales. So what, what is the federal law and, and the case in most states is if you want to purchase a firearm, if it is from a federally licensed gun dealer, you have to go through a background check and there is record keeping requirements on the part of the licensed gun dealer. If, however, you want to purchase a firearm from someone who is not a federally licensed gun dealer, you do not have to pass a background check and there are no records keeping. I, I liken that to an airline security system that sets up two lines at the airport. One line for people who would like to go through and, and go through all the scanners and take off various articles of clothing and so on and go through there. And another line that says, just jump on the plane. Because that's what we do in these, in these states that don't have comprehensive background checks. We say to people, you, you are free to make a choice. You may, you may go into a gun shop, but you're going to have a background check with records. or 
go online, go to a gun shop, go to other places, skip all that inconvenience. There's not a lot of logic, in my opinion, that if a, a, an instrument is lethal and we feel like there should be accountability and measures to keep it out of certain people's hands, it should extend to private sales as well. Something I'm going to talk about where, where we have a lot of research is another mechanism that you sort of add or complement to this background check system is, is a licensing system for handgun purchasers. You can think of it very similar to a driver's license. Um, and then seven states have some form, in, uh, six states in the District of Columbia have a registry system, at least for handguns. Uh, many are very interested appropriately in what our laws are to keep guns out of the hands of people who have committed domestic violence. Uh, federally, we, as I mentioned, we do cover that. Um, also, if you have what's called a final order for a restraining order for domestic violence, while that order is in place, the person who is subject to that order may not possess firearms. But there are important gaps. Uh, dating part partners are not covered. And the temporary orders, which is often actually the most dangerous time that we found out, uh, was involved in research looking at intimate partner homicides in 12 different cities uh, in the United States. We found that time right around when someone is getting a temporary restraining order is among the most uh, dangerous times. But most states do not cover that. Um, so let's, let's now get to this issue of sort of what our, our legal standards look like. Um, we did a study in which we looked at uh, data from a 2004 survey of state prisoners that the Department of Justice runs. And we looked at the 13 states that had the lowest standards for legal gun ownership that basically mim mimicked our federal standards. What we found is that those who were serving time for committing a violent crime with a firearm, only 40% of those were prohibited from possessing that firearm at the time they committed that violent act. Uh, the important part of this simple pie chart is that red slice. 29% of those offenders in other states that had higher standards would have been prohibited. And it gives you some sense of the potential gain for extending the prohibitions to a broader range of individuals with histories of violence and reckless behavior. This is just a, a, a dis age distribution. Uh, you, you won't be able to see it in the back and maybe even not even the front, but this is, this is a uh, age on the bottom here. And homicide offending peaks between the ages of 18 and 20. It, and it remains high well into the 20s, but then drops off quite dramatically. What many of us believe is that we could have, for some of the less serious offenses, not lifelong prohibitions, but prohibitions that take one through one's riskiest years and have a demonstrable effect in, in lowering gun violence. But again, right now, most states will allow very young people to possess handguns, as many as they want, really. Uh, we formed uh, some colleagues in, uh, formed a uh, what we call a consortium for risk-based firearm policy in the months following Newtown. We actually formed with the intent of trying to have more evidence-based policies as they relate to the uh, mental illness and gun policy. And we actually came away, this is actually to my surprise because we've had these conversations many times and never reached consensus. But at this meeting, we reached consensus that we would actually have a much larger impact on interpersonal violence if the focus was not what diagnosis you may or may not have for mental illness, because most mental people with mental illnesses are no more violent than someone without the mental illness. What is far more predictive of violent behavior is violent behavior. Kind of makes sense. So, Though there are, of course, a subset who have experienced prior violent behavior and have a mental illness. 
And so we can look at those intersections and try appropriate interventions, policies, and otherwise. But it's important that w to, to recognize we're going to really, the, the, the suicide dimension of this problem, you can more accurately label as a mental health problem. It's not solely a mental health problem, but that's far more accurate. But if you look at the interpersonal gun violence, some, some of the best research says that no more than 5% might be attributable to serious mental illness. So we, we have these other recommendations that um, we think are driven, that are driven more by data and would have more impact. Uh, focusing on violent misdemeanor convictions, multiple alcohol or drug related arrests in a short amount of time. Actually, the evidence is much stronger on alcohol than drugs. We're, we're gonna be meeting this winter and actually re-examining whether the multiple drug offenses is still a defensible thing. But the relationship between alcohol abuse and violence is much, much, much stronger than drug abuse and violence. Um, temporary restraining orders we've covered, and this notion of gun violence restraining orders came out of uh, that, that body. If you haven't heard about this, this is something that California adopted in, uh, that became effective January of this year. It is actually a ballot on the ballot initiative in the state of Washington. Basically, it would operate like other civil restraining order processes that we are more familiar with with domestic violence, but it extends that if you have a family member, someone close to you who you see is really in a very, very dangerous place, whether it has to do with a mental uh, breakdown or whatever, and they have access to firearms, that at least on a temporary basis, you give authority to remove those firearms so that situation can be assessed. So a lot of risk is very um, uh, incident focused. So there can be a crisis time where it's very important to uh, give authorities to, to remove guns in a temporary way until you know that that is a safe situation. What do we know about the evidence? What we know is that generally when you extend to cover more of the violent behaviors, you have uh, a greater reductions in violence. We know for domestic violence restraining orders, for example, several studies, including some that I've uh, been involved in, show that it reduces intimate partner homicides. Not by as much as I would like, probably in about 8%, but it does have a protective effect. Extending um, prohibitions for violent misdemeanors, uh, Garen Wintemute is found in California, reduced violent offending by 29% in the affected group. We have some research that we're about to write up now looking at intimate partner homicides and actually finding that the thing that is most protective is something that is not specific to domestic violence, but it is focused more broadly at people with misdemeanors for violent offending. Um, uh, Jeff Swanson also published research showing that the uh, mental health prohibitions in many places really aren't working simply because the records aren't available to do the screening. And when Connecticut fixed that problem, they were able to look at the granular uh, data for who was directly affected by that. It lowered their violent offending by roughly 50%. What about these accountability measures uh, that I refer to? Um, so let's just think about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, how in the world do criminals get guns, okay? So a lot of conversations when it comes to gun policy or gun control, you know, or something like this, like, oh, okay, yeah, boy, these, these measures seem sort of reasonable, but criminals just break laws anyway. Like, why would these, you know, only law-abiding people are going to buy by them anyway? What, what's relevant? So what I hope to convince you of is that there is connections between what, what we call the legal and illegal market, and how easily guns flow from the legal to illegal has a lot to do with the set of regulations in place for firearm sales. But nearly 80% of criminals that we found in this same federal survey I referred to before uh, obtained their gun from not a licensed dealer but through, through some private transaction most of which were unregulated. There were no background check requirements for those transactions and no record keeping. 
theft accounted for 10 percent. Now, I recognize that some of this, what, what particularly frustrates me as a researcher is this second row, street or underground. Um, that could be so many different things, and it could be very confusing. Is that a trafficker? Is this somebody who's burglarizing homes and then selling them on the street? We, honestly, we don't know. But when you ask directly, did you steal a gun you used in crime, about 10% said that they did. Uh, another way to try to get your hands around where are these guns coming from and where are the points of diversion is to look at federal gun trafficking cases. There is a report now that I actually saw that uh, some members of Congress are calling for them to do a redo, meaning do with more recent data. But when they did a study looking at the late 1990s, they found very, some very common conduits for this diversion. Um, and they had to do principally with uh, unscrupulous uh, firearm, licensed firearm dealers who were either incredibly negligent or flat out criminal in how they were doing their businesses. And uh, straw purchasers were also an important conduit. Straw purchasers is someone who's purchasing a gun on behalf of someone who is prohibited. And then the final important channel was something they referred to as unlicensed sellers. These are individuals who, and President Obama was trying to deal with it with some executive orders that he set out in January of this year. But there's a subset of individuals who uh, sell a lot of guns, but they don't have a license as a business person, as someone is required if you are in the business of, of selling firearms. In this day and age, we all know you don't have a, to have a brick and mortar place to run a business where you sell a whole lot of products. So there are a lot of individuals who are selling guns online and at gun shows, making a fair amount of income that way, totally unregulated, completely unregulated. And that is something we need to address. Okay, most of, most of uh, I'm going to be throwing data at you, but I'm going to tell you a little story on, on this one that, that may relate to it, is this importance of problematic gun dealers. Uh, some of you may, if you are into this stuff, uh, the, the, a gun shop just outside of Milwaukee was in the news earlier this year having to do with a lawsuit. Um, they had um, facilitated pretty blatantly an illegal straw sale that um, a young man then used that gun to uh, permanently disable two Milwaukee police officers. And that I was, I was expert witness in that case, but it, it, went, it went forward. Uh, and, and they settled they, uh, that case. But Badger Gun was, has been a problematic gun dealer for decades uh, in West Milwaukee. And in May of 1999, uh, this is at the tail end of the Clinton administration, first Clinton administration, um, the ATF released a report that uh, singled out, the, I believe, the ten, top 10 licensed gun dealers in terms of how many of their guns are recovered in criminal use. And number one on that list was good old Badger guns and ammo in West Milwaukee. Literally two days later, now some other things have been going on in the background. Another licensed dealer lost his license nearby, and some other dealers in Chicago were being sued for their problematic practices. But two days later, these the people running this business announced they were making their own changes voluntarily in how they were selling guns and what type of guns they were going to sell. And I'm going to show you the dramatic effect that that had in just a minute. Um, later on, as more of these gun shops like Badger were being sued, uh, a variety of policymakers who are friendly to the gun industry started adopting laws to protect them, to insulate them from scrutiny, and particularly lawsuits. And Todd Tiart was sort of the worst actor, a, a Republican from Kansas. And when he was asked, why are you doing this, he just flat out said, I have a lot of friends who are gun dealers. He didn't say, I think this is the just thing to do, the rest, best for public safety. He said, I'm protecting my friends. Uh, I guess he didn't care about the friends who were dying in Milwaukee and some other places because of unscrupulous practices 
of a very small segment of licensed gun dealers. That's the beauty of some of this research actually is we see that maybe 5% of licensed gun dealers are connected to about 90% of the guns used in crime. Okay? So don't, don't believe that all these gun shops are all crooked or anything. That's not at all the case. It's a small number of bad actors that are taking advantage of very weak regulations and oversight. Um, so eventually, they, they end up losing their license for being so blatantly uh, and willfully violating firearm sales practice. Well, I, I want to show you a little data from, from our, our study. So this will be hard to see in the back, but uh, we're looking at um, the solid line here is guns that are sold by Badger guns and ammo and then recovered in crime. You see, this is when they were called out as being the number one dealer in the country selling guns that get used in crime. Then they did their voluntary practices, fell off a cliff, the rate at which their guns that they were selling were then used in crime. Don't tell me that how you run a business has nothing to do with how guns are used in crime when you look at this evidence. But the interesting thing is that they gradually felt less heat from this whole process. And then here comes our friend Todd Tiar to the rescue with his amendment that basically is bottling up the data. So no one can even know who is selling what guns that you are used in crime. The only reason I knew is I went to the Milwaukee Police Department and got the data directly from them. I could not get it from ATF. Okay, so you saw this is a 200% increase uh, following the TR amendment. And what is particularly notable is this dotted line is all the other gun shops. So Mr. TR is protecting the bad apple gun dealers, and this is how they're responding. The, the ones who don't need protection, this isn't affecting them as far as their guns being used in crime. Does that make sense? All right. We've done some research showing that when you do undercover stings to find these very small percentage of gun dealers, bring lawsuits against them, in some cases criminal prosecutions, you have pretty dramatic reductions in indicators of diversions of guns to criminal after a retail sale. Uh, if you look at within state gun dealer uh, uh, sales and then criminal involvement, a 62% reduction in Chicago, a 36% reduction in Detroit. Now, New York City uh, saw the evidence that we produced on these uh, cities and then wanted to do its own undercover sting in lawsuits. They had a very different situation because New York has much, much stronger laws than these other uh, places. And the vast majority of their guns were coming from out of state. So they sent in undercover uh, investigators outside states that were, tra that were trafficking guns to uh, criminals in New York City. The vast majority of those who were sued settled almost immediately. And, and New York was not asking them for a nickel. It asked them to abide by a code of responsible firearm sales practices, okay? We, we, we gave them the recommendations of what those practices should be. When that was instituted, we tracked in uh, about a 10 of the gun dealers that w there had electronic data, sales data, 82% reduction in the likelihood that any gun that they sold would end up in crime in New York City. Again, more evidence that what you do at a retail level matters with the diversion of guns to criminals. Okay, connects the dots between legal and illegal markets. Got it? All right. Um, what we're seeing more recently, of course, is more online, online sales. Uh, there's been some really interesting, uh, important research done by Everytown for Gun Safety showing that in um, websites like armplus.com that have sort of the least uh, sort of oversight that uh, you find a great number of individuals who are looking specifically, they only want to buy a gun dealer, uh, excuse me, a gun from someone who is not a licensed gun dealer. And in one uh, study they actually were able, for, for those who left phone numbers, um, say call me at such and such, 
they actually were able to get information on who those individuals were and their criminal histories and found that a, a, a significant number were actually prohibited purchasers who were taking advantage of the loopholes in our laws convenient in places like armslist.com. I mentioned using the gun trace data and looking at these measures of diversion. And we've published a couple of studies that look at the association between state firearm policy, sales policies and within state diversion. These are guns that are sold in a state and then used in crime in the same state, as well as looking at across state diversion or interstate trafficking. And what we see is some degree of consistency here, that these so-called permit to purchase or licensing uh, laws for handgun purchasers are highly protective, as is extending background checks to all sales. We found something very interesting when it had to do with regulation and oversight of gun dealers. For our first study, we actually surveyed law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, uh, in the states that had their own state regulations to oversee gun shops. They didn't leave it simply to the ATF. They recognized the ATF's uh, laws and resources are quite limited to really fully hold people accountable who are selling firearms. What we found is that the laws themselves were not associated with diversion. It was only when we had evidence that they were actually using the laws. And this will come back later when we talk about background checks in a moment. So you actually have to apply the laws rather than just do it just to appease somebody politically or whatever. You actually have to use the laws. Uh, we uh, should have but did not examine another accountability measure which has to do with mandatory reporting if you are a private citizen and you have a gun stolen. That is required of licensed gun dealers but not of private owners in most states. But what we found is that it was actually strongly associated with preventing a diversion of guns moving across state lines. Now I'm going to tell you a story about uh, two states, Missouri and Connecticut. These are mirror image states in the policies that they had in place and the changes that they made. So, uh, most recently, in terms of a policy change, in August of 2007, Missouri repealed a law that it had on the books for many decades that required background checks and a permit to purchase if you were going to purchase a handgun in the state, whether that's from a licensed dealer or a private seller. And you got that uh, permit or license through the local sheriff's office. Um, so they repealed this law and then there, there was no regulation of private sales and no sort of check, um, you know, these sort of impulse buys, just walk in, walk out, bring a straw purchaser into a gun shop. Those were now e much easier to do because before, I mean, just do your own thought experiment. Pretend you're a felon for a minute and you want somebody to buy you a gun, all right? So in one case you say, hey, let's go into Badger Guns and Ammo, and they never bother us. We'll be in and out of there in a few minutes. I'll give you a few bucks. Okay, we're good, right? And now do that thought experiment. You put your arm around your friend. You say, hey, I want you to buy a gun from me. First thing you need to do, you got to go down to a local law enforcement officer, and they're going to fingerprint you and photograph you, and they'll keep your records and what gun you buy. Okay, so do you think that would affect whether that person says yes or no? I, I'm thinking it might. I don't know. I don't, I'm going out on a limb there. So here's what we found. In, uh, here's a, one metric of diversion. These very short, the, the uh, interval between a retail sale and use in criminal uh, um, act, uh, we tracked over time. And what we found is basically a two-fold increase in this measure of diversion in Missouri when it got rid of those protections, okay? So very short interval between a retail sale and criminal involvement. Uh, we also found, and this is, this is what was particularly remarkable, because if you look at state to state and the percentage of their guns that are used in crime that were originally sold within the state versus out of state, those percentages are incredibly constant over time. They virtually they hardly ever shift, okay? 
But look what happened in Missouri, a very dramatic shift. It used to be about 55% of the guns used in crime in Missouri had been sold in Missouri. Go forward many years after these laws are, are removed, and by 2014, you have about three quarters of the guns used in crime coming from Missouri gun dealers. This is the more important graph. This is a simple difference between the firearm homicide rate in Missouri versus the rest of the United States, okay? So you'll see that it was fluctuating up and down about a 0.5 per 100,000 higher generally uh, compared to the rest of the states. And then very abruptly, beginning in 2008, you have a totally different uh, phenomenon. It is now fluctuating between 2 and 1.5 uh, homis gun homicides per 100,000 uh, difference. We have uh, very methodically tried to rule out a range of explanations of what, hap what the hell happened there. Like, how, how do you explain that? And we rule out that it had to do with policing levels. We rule out that it had to do with incarceration rate. We control for poverty, unemployment, general crime rates as, as measured by burglaries, as well as other public policy changes. And what we find is um, over a six year period, a 18% higher rate of gun homicide uh, associated with this policy change. That translates into about 49 per year additional as a result, as a result of this policy um, change. No other state, none of the rest of the 49 states, had a larger in, per capita increase in gun homicide rates over that time period, none. Um, and there was no change in non-firearm homicide rates. What might be most surprising is what happened with suicide rates. Suicide rates also increased significantly, 16%. And actually, because again, suicides are more common than gun homicides, that was 64 additional suicides every single year associated with this policy. So you're talking about more than 100 additional deaths per year following this policy change. Now, Connecticut did pretty much the opposite of what Missouri did. When they changed their policy back in October 1995, where they extended background check requirements for handgun sales to, for, for all private and, and dealer sales, and also put in a, a licensing system or a permitting system. The one main difference uh, uh, between Connecticut and what Missouri had is that they also had a safety training component into their law as well as fingerprinting as well. We published a study in the American Journal of Public Health showing that uh, in our estimates this reduced lowered um, gun homicide rates by 40% over the first 10 years the law was in place. We've extended the analysis for a full 18 years for the most data that we, we have available. And over that period, the rate is 29% lower than projected had that, the, that policy not been in effect. We also say, see basically the same thing going in the opposite direction with gun suicides, a 15% reduction in gun suicides, and even reductions in um, an 80% reduction in law enforcement officers killed by handguns in, while they were in the line of duty. Uh, this is take more time that I want to get into because I want to cover some other things. So Maryland. Um, in 2013, uh, they adopted something called the Firearm Safety Act that had many components. Many of them were focused on these accountability measures that I've been talking about. Now, while they previously had already required background checks for private sales as well as dealer sales, at least for handguns, they adopted a handgun licensing uh, provision as well. They also put, it in, put in mandatory reporting if your gun is stolen. And importantly, they gave the state police authority that they previously lacked to take action against licensed gun dealers who were not complying with state gun laws, giving them an ability that they didn't have to fine, suspend, or in some severe cases, revoke licenses. 
there were some other provisions. Those were the key things as relates to accountability. This is a moving average of this same sort of metric of, di of diversion of a gun sold um, and then used in crime shortly after within a 12 month period in cases where the purchaser is someone other than the criminal possessor. So this is like your classic straw purchase scenario. And what you see coincident with the change in the uh, October of 2013 is a noteworthy downward dropping off the cliff pretty much following this policy going into place. We did regression analysis to control for a variety of factors. Our estimates is that it decreased uh, these exact kind of transactions by 76%. And if you look, look, look more broadly, even uh, when the purchaser and possessor are the same individual, you also saw a 63% uh, reduction in those types of um, cases. Um, now, we did also did something that hadn't been done until this time. We simultaneously looked at the gun trace data and we actually did surveys of offenders in Baltimore City. So we uh, recruited for anonymous interviews, people on parole and probation in Baltimore City, and uh, asked them a series of questions about their experiences buying, selling, carrying guns. What we found is we, we uh, surveyed 195 offenders, and we found that 40% said the policy change in 2013 made it more difficult to get a gun. 40% said it affected the cost, meaning it was cost more and was more valuable on the street. 34% said um, that the law affected willingness of others to buy a gun for them. And 25% said that it affected their ability to um, identify trusted suppliers. This is something that came up in a lunch conversation we were having. It can seem as though there are just so many millions of guns in the United States that how in the world could you ever keep a criminal from having one? What we learned from our studies of the underground gun market is the scarce commodity is a trusted seller or supplier. In the vast majority of cases, and I've done several, a couple of these studies and, and looked at other people's similar studies, People do not want to do gun transactions with people they don't know, trust, or been vouched for, okay? So when you're, you're uh, uh, what this seemed to suggest that this affected their ability to do that. All right, we, what has been lacking, however, in our broader conversation and what's been going on background, going on in background checks in the United States is, by and large, we have not been discussing actually using those laws and enforcing them, um, which really I think is problematic, perhaps for obvious reasons. Uh, some of the laws have weak um, uh, penalties, actually almost all of them have relatively weak penalties, and some of them also have other burdens of proof that are very difficult to prove. So it, what ends up is very few people get actually held accountable if they're not complying with the law. We were studying the effects of these laws in Pennsylvania and Maryland. One of the most striking findings to me in our uh, preliminary analysis is uh, Pennsylvania provides sort of a, a really wonderful natural laboratory experiment, so to speak. So back in 1995, they extended background checks for all gun sales. However, the penalties were weak. Um, and it, from what data we had, there, there wasn't a whole lot of enforcement. Roughly around 2008, um, some interesting things happened. They increased penalties for this law violation and they actually, the state appropriated $5 million to Philadelphia to stand up a unit that the sole purpose was to investigate and hold people accountable for this. So what our preliminary evidence from Pennsylvania indicates is that it was only then where you saw the protective effects. And again, to me, this makes good sense. It only had protective effect when it was actually used. 
so here's the, the, the gun seller accountability agenda. We've talked about these. Uh, extending background checks, licensing and gun purchasers, make dealer uh, safety and law compliance data publicly available. So if you're going to go out to a restaurant tonight, you can go online, you can look at reviews, you can look at whether they've had health department violations, you're going to find all kinds of information about all kinds of things that we buy. You will find no at least government information relevant to the safety of these gun dealers. So as I said before, you have this 5% who seem to have some issues, right? How do you know which of those 5%, you know, you're going into a gun shop, you want to go purchase a gun, how do you know who's a good guy and a bad guy? Right now, the federal policies are such that we're bottling up that data. And at least the Badger experience suggests that that matters. Um, we need, as I said, to define what it means to be in the business. Right now it's too mushy, so a lot of people are getting around this law. Uh, and in federal law, in order to, hold pe to, to convict people of violating these for, for current firearm sales uh, violations, you not only have to prove that they broke the law, you have to prove that they did it willfully. So what that means in real terms, we had our own Badger Guns and Ammo kind of gun shop just outside of Baltimore City. And this was a bad operation. And ATF knew it from the initial inspection of them. It took them nearly a decade to put that person out of business because A, they had to prove not only the, they were violating laws, but doing it willfully, meaning year after year after year, they're still not complying. Um, so we have work to do there. And currently, uh, we have protections that make it incredibly difficult to actually sue someone who sells guns. Um, policies to keep guns from dangerous people are not controversial, actually, but banning guns is. So this is what I mean. We've, we've con conducted a couple of national surveys, most, most recently in um, January of 2015, and we always oversample gun owners. And what we found is for the set of policies that are very directly designed to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people, we found little to no difference and very, very high support for most measures by gun owners, okay? So, uh, the, these set of policies have to do with uh, the, the standards for legal gun ownership, and you see that basically they are, uh, most gun dealer, gun owners, excuse me, are uh, supportive of strengthening or basically raising standards for legal gun ownership. One thing to keep in mind when I, I mentioned this uh, about the legal standards for gun ownership, you have to be mindful this not only means who can legally purchase a gun and store it in their home. In more and more, the vast majority of states, what that means is that there is very little legal barrier then for that person to carry a gun loaded in a variety of public places. It adds a whole nother dimension of risk. When we look at the accountability measures and look at gun owners versus gun owner, non-gun owners, excuse me, we see Absolutely no difference between gun owners and non-gun owners. 84% want background checks for all gun sales. Um, about six in 10 gun owners are perfectly fine with licensing. And when we, we uh, looked at the states that already have licensing, uh, roughly about 80% totally fine with licensing. Okay, it's not a scary thing. It's, they've done it, it's not a big deal. So you have a lot of support for a lot of ways, including these accountability measures for gun dealers. Uh, and, um, all right. Um, we also know, how am I doing on time? I don't have a clock that I'm looking at here. Okay. No, it's five o'clock. It's five o'clock, okay, I'm gonna speed up. Okay, so hold on. Um, Basically, uh, I wanted to convey that we're doing surveys and focus groups with gun owners, and generally most of them are totally on board and are very safety conscious. They, if they do sell guns to strangers, some of them actually sort of voluntarily try to do things to make sure that this is a legal purchase, purchaser, 
such as requ uh, looking, uh, requiring a concealed carry permit, which is very common in a number of states. Um, the political path. You've got to shift the culture of war to, uh, from a rut we're in now. This is about, you keep hearing it's gun versus anti-gun, right? It's a, it's a flat out cultural battle, urban versus rural, coastal states versus mid-America and southern states. Um, that is precisely what the gun lobby wants because that keeps us in our same rut. We need to change how we talk about this issue. We, and th the way we're going to need to do that is to form relationships with gun safety uh, oriented gun owners. In public health, we talk a lot about cultural competence when we're trying to do behavior change when we're reaching across race, race, excuse me, racial, ethnic, uh, gender, other kinds of lines. It's the same issue when you're trying to get behavior change and social change when it comes to gun owners, okay? We need to know how do we gain trust, how do we respect them when we communicate on this issue. I think that is huge. We need to focus on keeping guns from dangerous people because A, that matters the most in terms of public safety, and B, it is the most politically uh, easy thing to do compared to, say, a broad ban on assault weapons, for example. As logical as that may sound, that to, to ban assault weapons, it gets you in a completely different space of having a conversation about banning a gun as opposed to a whole set of individuals who think guns are just fine. It's just you don't want the people who are violent to have them, right? So that, that I think is a challenge for us. I think finally we need to uh, connect the gun lobby to the industry, which has been done. I mean, they're, they're heavily funded by the industry. But I think also importantly, and particularly in this political time right now, we need to connect them to an insurrectionist movement. It's a, a movement that basically is questioning the legitimacy of uh, our democratically elected uh, government institutions and encouraging people, in essence, to take up arms if they're not happy with how that democratic election process goes. Uh, incredibly dangerous to our society and our democracy. And I think if you uh, are a candidate that can't wait to get your A-plus rating for the NRA, you got to own what they are saying to this insurrectionist crowd that wants to use arms to get what they can't get through the ballot box. Um, I have some other material I was going to cover, but I know that there's a lot of people who have questions and comments that they want to make. I'm going to just make a few general comments to not get into the details of, of my other slides. I want to convey that what we do in law enforcement matters. There's something called focused deterrence, very prevention-oriented on those who we know based upon a combination of intelligence and criminal history is driving a lot of violence in urban neighbor, neighborhoods. We can encourage them not to use violence not simply by threatening to throw them in jail, but also actually reaching out to them with services and from people from their community that are calling for them to come be part of the community and be a positive part of the community. That has worked more consistently than any single thing we have done to address gun violence. It is not easy to do. There's a lot of these things are not easy to do. The public health strategy that used another strategy, a public health strategy, uh, hires former, often gang members, to work in the neighborhoods that they are from to gain trust from those individuals to show them a new way, to show them how to mediate, how to resolve conflicts without shooting one another, uh, to um, basically change the norms and be their own local heroes, positive forces. What we find there, I've studied this uh, approach in Baltimore since 2007, uh, over, since to, from 2007 to 20, uh, 20, through 2015, 
uh, 27% reduction in shootings associated with the application of that uh, prevention model. Um, the final thing, actually, before I got to that public health, I, I wanted to say one other thing as it relates to enforcement. Um, and, and I alluded to this on the drug when I mentioned uh, the, the, as it relates to uh, our policing of drugs. Uh, we just completed a study in Baltimore looking at data from uh, 2003 through the end of 2015 and looked at a whole range of things that were being done to try to address homicides and shootings. And we're, we're particularly interested in drug law enforcement practices. What we found is that that incredibly costly practice, costly in so many ways in terms of the actual police, prosecutors, jails, but costly to the communities that are losing fathers and contributing uh, members of their communities because they are involved in this illegal economy. I'm not saying the, everybody in that industry is, is a choir boy by any stretch, but this is a public health problem. And what uh, what we find is that when there are surges, when there are big increases in drug sales arrest, you actually have more shootings that occur. You are disrupting an illegal economy. And because that demand does not go away, and sadly, the labor supply for that drug industry is endless, I'm sad to say, what you simply do is you incentivize using violence to settle whatever disruption occurred when you brought in and arrested a lot of people. So, so and, and this is very consistent with a broader set of studies. Actually, it was, it's rather shocking how little research there is on one of the most common forms of policing, particularly in urban areas. But when it is systematically studied, it more often than not shows increases in violence rather than decreases in violence. So we can totally shift our attention to gun offenders where we have a, actually a pretty consistent track record when those are applied in a focused manner with reductions in gun violence. So I think that shift is very important. I'm gonna end it there so we can have time for questions and um, comments. There, there's a mic, I think, so if you'll just hold for a second. I'm Sandy Lane, and I teach public health here. Um, I'm part of a research team in Syracuse working on neighborhood violence and trauma due to neighborhood violence. And Helen is part of our research team, Helen Hudson, uh, first row. And so is the chief of police uh, trauma response team, which is a neighborhood group and uh, Street Addiction Institute Incorporated in another neighborhood group, and Mothers Against Gun Violence. Um, so we've it's been- It's great that you have those groups. I mean, oh, congratulations to Syracuse amazing. and thank, thank you we've for We've been that. working together for now five years, written a bunch of grants, some got funded, uh, published articles together, um, and we've um, begun to address the trauma uh, in neighborhoods inadequately. One of the last maps we did was a gun uh, violence map in Syracuse with data from the chief of police. Um, there's about th 325 gunshot episodes per year documented by the police, 22 to 25 murders. Um, and then there's a bunch of other people who are killed with stabbings and sure. s stranglings and sure. stuff. Um, and so where the elementary schools are in gunshot clusters, there's seven of them out of the 19, um, suspensions of children is tw are twice as high in the elementary grades, and uh, third grade reading and math scores are half as high. So um, we've been struggling to think about what we do next. Right. We've actually uh, tried a, a fair number of um, things, which are, some of them are working somewhat. Yeah. We would like your help. We would, I just, th I'm speaking for everybody, I'm sorry, but they'll probably mm -hmm. agree. Uh, right, Helen? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're, we agree all right, and, and in do. So, uh, so we would like your help to do exactly what you did in New York City. And okay. I know Chief Fowler, who is a 
wonderful person, chief of police, would agree. Uh, we would put the people behind finding where those guns came right. from. I, I think that would be fantastic. So uh, it is much easier to do on a local level this sort of examination. Yeah. Uh, you, it, it, you encourage local law enforcement to say, we not only want to arrest people after they shoot somebody, we want to try to prevent this. We want to, we want to hold people accountable who might be part of the process of this channel to, to individuals. And law enforcement themselves can take it upon themselves. They submit the traces, you know, the, they recover a gun, put down the information, they send it electronically to ATF, ATF does the trace, and now Syracuse Police owns that data. So they can say, yeah, the X number of these Guns came from this shop, this one, this shop. And it's not just the overall number of guns. It's the ones that really move rapidly from a retail sale and then boom, they're in crime. Something's wrong. Something's wrong when it happens really fast. It's far less likely to be a theft and far more something going on. And, and it's not, you know, you can't, it's not always going to be the dealer. But when Dealers are given incentives. They know people are looking, and particularly people with badges are looking. They're safer. Well, They're safer. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for making those stands to the insight team here today to help us. Sure. The gentleman back here. How you doing, sir? Thank you. My name is Clifford Ryan, and I do a organization called OGs Against Violence, Our Generation Against Violence. I just want to say um, it's an honor to be here and uh, to get your knowledge and um, information as far as gun violence is concerned. One of the things that I do is I go within the community and directly reach out to the ones doing the violence. So the mental aspects of it, I'm trying to learn how to deal with more because it's pretty traumatizing, you know, when I deal with individuals um, getting ready to shoot. I was able to stop 35 individuals from going to do gun violence. So I'm trying to gain this from Thank you, thank you. I'm trying to gain more knowledge of the mental aspects, because I know you spoke on that, um, distinguishing what, you know, what the mental capacity of a person is as far as that threat of violence is concerned? Right. Um, so first of all, of course, thank you for the work you're doing. It's very heroic. Um, when we started studying this program in Baltimore, and we, the very first community that put it into place was actually a stone's throw from our campus. And, um, and it historically had one of the highest rates of gun violence. Um, they went for a two-year period with no homicides whatsoever once they had people doing the kind of work that you did. That had not happened. No one could remember a two-year period where no, there were no homicides. We honored those individuals. We created a Community Hero Award at our School of Public Health and had a big ceremony to recognize them. And I think what you, you and other people who do that need to be recognized. When you think about what that is, and you described it very well, but Again, try to put yourself in somebody's shoes. Your job is go into the most dangerous parts of a city, find the people at highest risk. You don't have a gun, a badge, or anything, and you're going to convince them because of your credibility, your heart, your commitment to peace, to put down the gun. And they do it. It's not easy, though. It is not easy. So if you look at what happened in Baltimore, we have some shiny success stories, and quite honestly, not. So a broader thing that I wanted to convey in a lot of these different approaches that I can say, you know, I'm an academic, so we do these jargony things like evidence-based approaches, right? So we have evidence-based approaches in a lot of different things, but the reality is that they don't work on autopilot. You have to get the right people, and you have to have the right management, and you have to do it wholeheartedly, right? And so that did not always play out in each and every each of these communities. Some had really wonderful success. Overall, as I said before, 27%. Um, I think, you know, 
we, I also had a doctoral student who interviewed individuals like yourself doing that work to learn how in the heck do you do this? You know, because I have to admit, when we first started this, I was a skeptic. I was like, huh? You're gonna go in there and tell gang members not to shoot each other? They're gonna laugh at you. Get out of here. Um, but they did it. They did it. And uh, brave. brave, brave people. We, um, hats off to them. So what I would, a reality that I would love to see is that workers like yourself are routinely thought of as this is part of how we can uh, keep communities safe. We can't get rid of the police department. We need the police department. We need them desperately. They do very dangerous jobs. And to do a lot of things that we're talking about, you need effective law enforcement. But what we learned in our interviews with people doing what they call violence interruption work, you can appeal to a lot of different things. You can, but one of the things you can appeal to is you don't want to go to jail, do you? Right? And, and, but you got to have somebody, hopefully, that's backing that up, somebody that will hold them accountable. It can't be you because you're not going to gain their trust. But these things have to work complementary fashion. And, and I spent most of my career sort of straddling the public health world and law enforcement, right? Because neither one of them can do it alone. We got to have prevention-oriented law enforcement, and we have to have prevention resources like violence and ruptures like that. Have people heard of this notion of gun violence as a contagion? It spreads, OK? And part of that process is one shooting will lead to another and another with retaliation. And when we think about it that way, it can seem very daunting. Like, how in the world could you ever stop it? Because it's contagious, right? Somebody gets shot, and it's going to just go on indefinitely. But here's the thing. When you stop a shooting, if some, the work like this gentleman is doing, or the proper policing or proper law, you often are not just stopping one shooting. You're preventing the shooting that would occur that followed that and followed that. And that is why we see these huge cyclical fashions. And, and the joke I made about the big reduction in the, the 90s, OK? I think that exactly what was going on. We started doing more, a variety of effect, more effective law enforcement and prevention. We didn't get it all right by any stretch. But the success built on itself. It built on itself. So you created a new norm, a new reality. Do I talk too much? I, I need somebody else to, yeah, this, can we have this gentleman here? Hi, my name is Ron O'Hanley. I serve on the Maxwell Advisory Board. Um, I want to address the last point you made in your prepared remarks, this notion that um, heightened enforcement or very stiff, rigorous drug laws and heightened enforcement of them actually lead to more gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, lots of parts of the country where whatever move there was towards decriminalization is actually going away given the opioid crisis. Have you studied, because I don't know if there's a state that's actually fully decriminalized, have you studied some countries that have, for example, I know Portugal, I, I quite uh, certainly decriminalized, and I think they actually legalized yeah. all drugs. So generally, if you look at the international literature, there's not a lot to go on. There's not a ton of evidence. But generally, you find what I said before, which is the, the more you back off from that, OK, we're just going to arrest everybody and do that, the better results you get. More, most commonly, uh, what you are doing with these heavy-handed approaches is you're disrupting things without really changing the supply and demand issues going on. Uh, so, the, the, so I, I think um, in, in Colorado, for example, I know the very short, uh, brief evidence uh, has to do with marijuana. Actually, is that. Um, Crime has gone down uh, with legalizing marijuana. Um, I, I don't want to make this sound real easy, because it shouldn't be easy. But um, we can do so much better in addressing uh, substance abuse than we do. We have put m the lion's share of our resources into the enforcement basket. We said, this is a crime, and this is the way we're going to solve it. And I think the bulk of the evidence suggests that 
has been, not been effective uh, in reducing substance abuse, and it has been not always, but often counterproductive uh, with respect to violent crime. Um, I can totally empathize. Like, if, if someone, I hope this never happens, made me commissioner, police commissioner in Baltimore, okay? Um, I work with him closely. I respect him a great deal, but he's got probably the world's most difficult job. So he has handed a situation where he, there's been a long history of not good relationships with police and community. It's hard for them to, if somebody shoots someone, nobody's gonna, few people want to come forward with evidence and testify, their fear for their own life. Um, so I, it would be very understandable if I was in that position to say, well, we got these handy drug laws. These guys are shooting people. We'll get them on a drug charge and put them behind bars. And that's generally how business has been done. And I totally get that basic understanding. But I think it's a relatively short-sighted uh, approach when you look at the economics of it and you look at the data. It, it's, not, it's not really helping. The major drug bust that's sort of, okay, we're gonna take down this organization that's w working in West Baltimore or whatever, we find in the best set of circumstances when we give all the most generous assumptions is that uh, you might depress shootings for about five months and they go precisely back to where they were. That's one of the best case scenarios. I want to give this. Uh, I just want to make a comment because I know we're talking about. I'm with. I co-founded Mothers Against Gun Violence. I'm part of the trauma response team, and what I'm finding is we're working in the schools because we have to start working with the younger population because when we go into the schools, the majority of every child from third to fourth grade have either experienced gun violence or stabbings or witness someone in their immediate family mm -hmm. being murdered in some form. And I think that is now we need to start in some of the lower grades before they come through the cycle right. of the violence. Well, there, as it was mentioned earlier, there's, there's a growing body of research showing the damaging effect of being exposed to that kind of violence, particularly when you're young. Is, it is very damaging. It doesn't mean you are scarred for life. You, if you get the appropriate supports, it, it can matter. Uh, one thing I'll just make a brief comment. I was, uh, I headed something we uh, called a homicide review commission in Baltimore for a year. Uh, and we looked in depthly at the individuals connected, both victims and suspects in homicides. Probably the most striking thing to me was virtually all of them had early school issues, school failures. Um, how many of them were connected to early trauma and other things, I don't know. But it underscored the importance of if you can give young people the attention they need, the supports they need early, that is our best prevention. Virtually everyone involved in the most serious forms of violence has not succeeded in school. They, and, and that's a shame because we actually know how to do this stuff now. There's a lot of good research on how to do early interventions, how to support young people. We need to actually invest in them rather than just say, let's lock people up after the fact. This gentleman, one more. One more? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, I think I can talk loud enough. Um, I am a Missouri gun owner. You don't have to apologize. We, we just I'm serious. Enough, um, yeah. But, um, and I was highly impressed with what you propose and the types of changes that you want to see. Um, because like you said, it is a lot different than just banning guns. Um, but I do want to question you on the slide about your assault weapons ban with before, after, and during. Mm -hmm. And I, that struck me as putting okay. too much on that one thing. Okay. Fair enough. So, A, I'm glad that I, I got a gun owner to respond. Yeah, one here. Good. I'm glad. No, but, but I want this to be part of the conversation. I, I want that kind of feedback. So I should have said, point taken, I should have said the simple graph that I showed you is not proof that a, the assault weapon ban was connected to all of this. I don't think that's the case. I do think 
and there's a, there is a correlation between ammunition capacity of someone who engages in that practice and how many people get shot, okay? So I don't think it's completely unrelated, but it's not everything that's driving this, this increase that we're seeing now. So, uh, but, but I do think the weapon is one, one component of this. I think there are other really important social changes and other things going on. Um, but it is certainly not all the assault weapon uh, at all. Uh, let me just say, sure. uh, I'm on the advisory board as well for Maxwell. I, I live in Canada, so I uh, see a very different scenario I bet. Uh, there uh, where people basically, uh, there are more guns per capita in Canada than there are here. Hmm. And if you match that reality to the low statistics, it has a lot to do with a, a culture framework and also the fact that uh, uh, if you have a pistol in Canada, you are only able to use it going to a, a, a gun range and coming home. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot carry it unless you are a certified trapper and you're on your trap line in, in the bush. Uh, so, I mean, the reality is that uh, the multiple firearms and so forth uh, are used at shooting ranges, mm -hmm. but uh, it changes everything with the right legislation. Right. Uh, it I, doesn't take away people's rights. I mean, I was uh, in the uh, duck blind just uh, two weeks ago. So, I mean, the reality is that there's a, a lot of activity gun-wise within a proper framework that uh, does not lead to more crime and uh, does not lead to uh, violence like we see here. I, I couldn't have said it better. I, I'm really glad you added that <coughs> component to it because that's really how I view this as well. We have a lot of guns in the United States. The vast majority are in the hands of people generally being safe with them, okay? Um, but as you've seen, we make it insanely easy for people to do bad things with guns. And if we just do, actually the things that gun owners want us to do based on upon the surveys, we would be in a completely different place. We would be closer to Canada, not exactly, but we'd be closer to, could to I, Canada. Can I just one quick one? In, uh, right after uh, I did my doctorate here, I was in Miami uh, at, at a university of academic setting, but I was consulting in the really tough neighborhoods of Overtown, mm -hmm. yeah, I know Annie Coleman, Liberty City, mm -hmm. and I've known a lot of the people there. And uh, you're talking about uh, uh, heroes uh, in Overtown, uh, at that time at least, there was a gentleman by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was part of the informal network that knew everybody in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the community mm -hmm. and understood everything. <coughs> And I, I got to know him quite well. And the reality is, those kinds of informal leaders, do you uh, make, uh, let's say, uh, hero recommendations or, or bring... You got to acknowledge I, I them and I reward them. People have to be recognized and uh, congratulated for who they are. Now, it could uh, bother their... That's exactly what I'm trying to do in Baltimore, by the way. They could, it could bother their street creds. Uh, but probably Actually not, not. I don't think so. Because yeah. it would increase them because they're known for who they do, who they are, and what they prevent. Yeah. So many people are getting shot over respect. Mm -hmm. That's right. Lack of respect. Give people respect for peacemaking rather than respect them for it's violence. It's another kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And tell them what you're going to do. I just straight out tell them. I'm yeah. going to... Tell them straight out. If I come to see you and you got a gun, guess what? I'm seven. <laughs> so right. let's, uh, can we give uh, Dr. Webster a round of applause? That was terrific.